In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, Trinity. I like to say that. <laughs> I don't get to do it too often, but I'd love to say it because you're wonderful people. I want to say this. Christ calls us to be last so that he can make us first. Jesus had 12 apostles, but we know very little about many of them. We know Matthew, the tax collector, of course, and Doubting Thomas and Judas, but the big three were the brothers, James and John and Simon Peter. Peter, James, and John. These three were privileged to be present at the Transfiguration and at Gethsemane. All three, Peter, James, and John, they were tempestuous men. Peter was always going off hat cocked, saying or doing something foolish. He was the one who cut off a man's ear at Gethsemane. But Jesus called James and John the sons of thunder, so they must have been pretty volatile as well. Of the three, Peter was the natural leader, always first to speak out, first to act. Peter was sometimes right, sometimes wrong, but he was never uncertain. But James and John were not content to let Peter run off with the leadership prize. In our gospel lesson today, they got Jesus off to the side and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What a way to ask for something. Do for us whatever we ask of you. Children are like that. Would you do something for me? And parents know better than to say yes without first learning what they want. Jesus asked, what is it you want me to do for you? And they responded, grant us to sit, one on your right hand and one on your left in glory. The right hand and the left hand, the places where the kings seat their favorites. The right hand and the left hand, the powerful positions. And in many ways it is so yet today. At conference tables in boardrooms, the chairperson sits at the head of the table and the chief lieutenant on each side, and they sit on the right or the left. You can usually tell how much power each person has where they are usually seated around the table. But the closer you get to the chairperson, the more powerful they are. By the time you get to the far end of the table, there isn't much power left. Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your, at your left in your glory. But I was thinking as I was writing this, what about Peter? What happened to Peter, the other member of the big three? James and John were asking Jesus to push Peter into the background. They wanted to be the big two. Grant us to sit, one on your right hand and one on your left in your glory. James and John, obviously, hadn't been listening to Jesus. Jesus told the disciples that he was going to Jerusalem to suffer and to die. James and John let that go in one ear and out the other. They thought that Jesus was going to Jerusalem to establish himself on David's throne and they couldn't hear anything that Jesus said to the contrary. Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. It was a selfish request. And the other disciples, when they heard it, they were furious. All of them expected to be VIPs once Jesus got where he was going. They sometimes argued about which of them was greatest. They were all jockeying for position and resented James and John's attempt to jump in front of the line. But Jesus 
he didn't rebuke James and John, nor did he rebuke the other disciples. Instead, he used the opportunity to teach them something about his kingdom. His kingdom would be quite different from the one that the disciples expected. He reminded them that they had seen powerful people work. They saw kings, governors, and rulers, and he told them that the ones that they thought of as great were instead really tyrants. They got where they were at the expense of the people, defenseless people, vulnerable people, and Jesus told the disciples that they must not be like that. He tells us that we must not be like that. He says, whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be a slave to all. That's pretty profound if you think about it. And then he tells them, and he tells us that he has set an example. He has been a servant himself. He has been a slave himself. And he says, for the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Be a servant, be a slave. That isn't who the disciples thought they wanted to be. And it may not be what we want to be either. We, may, we may, may want to be in charge, to be the decision maker, to enjoy the perks of office, to tell other people what to do. And that is often the way of the world today. Look out for number one. It tells us. Toot your own horn, it tells us. Go for the gusto it tells us. But Jesus tells us to give all we can. There is a popular philosophy which teaches to get life, you must grab it. Jesus taught that to win, we must surrender. The conflict is absolutely irrevocable. The world tells us one thing, Jesus tells us another. Whom should we believe? Each of us must decide. I will say this. I personally am deeply grateful that so many people believed Jesus because it is people who believed Jesus who make life bearable, make the world, or at least a little part of it, a fit place to live. People who loved Jesus enrich my life and your life and other lives all over the world. When I was in New Mexico, I was looking for a church to attend. And I went to a church not far from me. And when I got there, there was a sign someone had posted at the entrance to the sanctuary. And it was St. Bede's Episcopal Church in Santa Fe, New Mexico. The signs said simply, servant's entrance. There was no other door into the sanctuary, no other way to get in or to get out. If you wanted to attend worship there, you had to enter through the servant's entrance. And what I thought was, gee, no one could have ever said anything better. Through the centuries, people who have loved Christ have also loved and served their neighbors. They have blessed us, and God has blessed them in return. In the Beatitudes, Jesus says that such people are blessed, and indeed they are. Jesus calls us to be servants, to serve the needs of others, to put others first. He promises that if we will do that, he will put us first and make us great. He promises that when we bring sunshine to the lives of others, he will cause it to shine on us as well. It is a promise that he has kept a million times over. Try it, become a servant, bring blessings to others, and see if Christ 
doesn't bring a double blessing to you. And I would remind you, Christ calls us to be last so that he can make us first. And to that I say, thanks be to God. <laughs>